Good morning. Right, so for those of you who are working early, this was the openings video of the DevOps conference we had in Hamburg uh, last year. Uh, Patrick Dubois, the guy who actually coined the term DevOps, uh, always makes great videos to, to start conferences with. And we can benefit from that video to start already telling a bit about what DevOps is before the audience is there. So, let's get started. Who am I? I'm Chris Bertrand. I, uh, ages ago, about like 15 years ago, I used to be a developer, and then I uh, moved to the infrastructure part because I always had to build my own machines, and nobody ever put stuff ready for me. So I've been building cloud before Amazon current cloud. Um, I've helped writing a couple of books. I guest blogger for a couple of months. I have my own blog. And um, when I talk to audiences, I tell them they should try to survive the 10th floor test. Is there anybody in the audience who knows what the 10th floor test is? The 10th floor test. The 10th floor test is the idea that you can take any random machine in your infrastructure, take it out of the 10th floor building, and be up and running in no time again. It means that you can actually survive disaster when your infrastructure breaks down. So there's a bunch of alternative titles for this talk. Uh, probably the best one for this audience is why your startup needs an automated infrastructure. Uh, but it's more about other stuff too. So what is it about? Let's take a look at what Tim Bray said on his blog last year. Um, he basically figured out that today's startups, young small companies, are better at building applications and putting them in production than the big fat enterprises which have spent millions and billions on their infrastructure and still don't get anything done. So, why? Because in the old days, and lots of developers still work like this, they don't talk to people. They just sit and hide in their corner, hide in one of those little cubicles and then start finding code. And then by the time, they have to deliver software, they have to deliver their packages. They just show it over the wall to the people who have to run the infrastructure, and it's like, what's this? How, how should we run this? Oh, and by the way, uh, the software we just gave you, you have to make it high available, it has to be able to um, be up and running all the time, and it has to scale beyond Belgium, we have to have 10 million users, we have to support everything. But they didn't think about how their software should cope with it. So what happens is that what happens is that after two minutes, the devs and the ops guys are fighting. Um, and yes, that's not fine. So what happens ten days into operation? Um, the ops guys figure out, oh, hang on, what's this machine doing? Why is it at one point hundred? Um, What's this? Are these log files in the database? Is this user data? Can I drop it because my disk is full? Um, why is it this database actually under such high load? Does this application really need to query all the users and get all the user data from it? And well, basically we end up with a nice crash. But let's not panic. Um, we've learned over a couple of years that you can solve these issues. We need to get people together on the same table all the time. We need to talk about ops, about employment, about the non-functional requirements at a point in time where the ID of your project starts. So that probably was about yesterday evening. And I have to thank Ramon for making this slide because there's something missing in the list. You see developer, marketing people, legal, but there's, except maybe the jack of all trades, there's no ops people in there. So I'm happy to be here. Um, what do you need to think about? You need to think about security. Um, who can access your application? What can they read? You need to think about backups. You do need backups, right? If your application crashes on Saturday evening, how are you going to restore your user data? Are you going to be, well, down for the rest of the weekend? Um, you need to think about how you're going to upgrade your application in production, because you might have written something once, but when you add new features, how are you going to put them in production? Uh, you need to think about all this kind of stuff. So how do you start with this? Well, if you really want to get the whole flow, and you want to do something what today we call continuous delivery, then you need to think about 
version control. Every code you're writing today should be somewhere in version control. So who's writing code today? Is it all the version control? No, no. Okay. Well, it's a good start. So how do you build your software? How do you test it? Are you testing it? Are you doing unit tests? Yeah, okay. Let's find out. Um, how do you keep track of bugs? Who does? Redmine. Redmine, Godzilla, GitHub. Great. Okay. So there's already a start. And how do you actually test your code on a live platform? Monkeys. <laughs> on an actual platform which is identical to what you're going to use in production. Okay. So, if your project becomes a bit bigger, bigger, so something like Sunday afternoon, you're going to see that you want to have different environments. You want to have development environment for testing, if you want user acceptance, so basically your marketing people can see what they're going to put in production, maybe some pre-production tests, and then finally production. You want to be able to run tests in all stages here, and be able to roll back when your build fails, when your software is broken and your tests are not what you want them to be, then you have to be able to not go through the whole cycle, but already be able to roll back the first part. You want to have parallel builds, because you want to have your infrastructure built the same way your software. And these days you see three layers, which is basically the software build, the infrastructure build, and then the complex part, the most difficult part. What about your data? What about your user data? Because we've got lots of experience on doing software and infrastructure building, but how do you manage your user data? Could you, could you elaborate on this one? So, um, take for example a website. You can test all the software. You can test how to deploy the software. You can reproduce all that stuff. At the moment, there's user-generated data in there. You have to be able to isolate the user-generated data from your builds, from your software, from your infrastructure. You might not want to have, for example, um, a health company, might not want to have the real data of actual users in their testing environment, because it's not the data their testers should see. They should have similar data, but not the actual data, for privacy reasons. So it's going to be a matter of being able to isolate the data, but still have valid data to test on. And that's not going to be easy. Um, so, if we talk about development and testing environments, you want to have as identical as possible test environments. Uh, one guy hacking on his macOS X laptop, then the other guy putting something in production on Ubuntu, and then the next server being a central box, that's not going to help you. Um, there's all the war stories about people putting software in production on totally different application servers, on totally different operating systems, on totally different um, storage infrastructures, which means that software is going to behave different. Try to do your development on something that's going to look like production. If you want to develop something that's going to run on Amazon, don't develop it on Rackspace. Put it on Amazon. So, if you want to do all that stuff, there's lots of behavior and functional tests you want to put in. You want to do it continuous, you want to do it automated, you want to be able to build and deploy your software, launch a virtual machine somewhere, run all your tests and dispose of the virtual machine. Because, and then you can come to something which is a controlled, continuous deployment environment. And then it's about time to go live. So, software is built, you know how to build, infrastructure because we've been doing that for ages. But still, some software vendors still think that it's okay to send in a package which installs and then have some guy go to a GUI to configure all the properties, configure all the usernames and do that manually. Now, think if your application is really going to scale. Do you want to go to a web GUI to configure a thousand instances? Well, IBM Oracle, they still think we want to. So, Luke Anise, one of the guys who's running Public Labs these days, he stated a couple of years ago that if your computer cannot install your software, the installer is broken. So, if you look at the technical parts, well, there's lots of tools that you can use to do an automated infrastructure. Um, if you need one, I'll be happy to explain more about it. So, so that brings us to this, continuous delivery. Um, who knows about continuous delivery? Okay, a couple of guys. Um, Jess Humble wrote a great book on 
all the pitfalls, all the stuff you have to deal with when you want to do the TS library. If you take everything from the past 20 slides, then you can probably be sure that you have something that looks like continuous delivery. So let's look at what's not in the continuous delivery part. That's the stuff that you need to be able to manage about 1,000 nodes or more. The idea that you can just launch another Amazon instance and have everything up and running. There are tools for that. There's Steve Engine, there's Shep, there's Puppet. Uh, Shep and Puppet are the two most famous ones these days. But just as the developers do, the system admin guys should put everything under version control. And even when everything is deployed, it's not the end. You have to think about monitoring, about upgrading. Uh, you have to think about high availability. What if one server falls over? Does the other one take over? Um, you have to think about scale. Well, Belgium might not be the issue, but if you want to grow abroad, think about scale. Um, monitoring is also an important thing. For example, eBay has one big metric. How many turnover they have per minute? And if something goes down there, they know what the turnover should be at a certain point in time. They don't care about how many machines are down. They don't care about some web server malfunctioning. They care about their revenue. And in the metrics they have, built in their applications, they know if revenue falls below a certain threshold, something is down. And then they start drilling into the infrastructure and see what's actually going on. Um, things system administrators like is knowing how many concurrent users are actually on the site so they can actually get an ID of what the load should be. We should have visibility on what are they doing. Are they actually buying stuff? Are they not buying stuff? Are they critical? Are they just browsing? And you want to have metrics also for your marketing department there. So, if you can get all that stuff together, it means that you can throw stuff out of the window. Um, um, I've been saying this kind of stuff for ages, and so with DevOps growing up and with people actually starting the username, I'm not alone anymore. Some people still think I am, but I'm not. There's a whole movement out there. We got lots of conferences discussing this stuff. Uh, DevOpsDave.org. There's going to be um, a whole dev room at Fosdem next week. We're going to have a conference in Boston in March, I guess. Uh, there's going to be one in uh, Mountain View again in uh, June. There's going to be one in Göteborg next, uh, I guess, October, November. So there's a lot of people with this idea out there, mostly active in startups, mostly active in different organizations, doing cloud stuff, doing online stuff. So, want to dev up? Well, there's no real definition. Uh, it's definitely not one guy, it's definitely not a role, it's no strict rules. It's getting people together, getting devs and us together and breaking all the silence, getting them out of their comfort zone and letting them learn and work, to get, learn and work together. But it's something you really need if you want to have an infrastructure that scales, if you want to have a startup that, apart from having a great ID, also differs in operation, differs in actually the execution of the ID. So, what it is about, and this is a term coined by uh, John Willis and uh, what's the other guy named Edwards, I always forget his name. They said, what is DevOps really about? Well, DevOps is about four things. It's about culture, how do organizations work together, how do developers, infrastructure people, their management, the network guys, the DBAs, the security people, how do they work together? So it's culture, it's about automation, it's about being able to reproduce what you've done before being able to actually survive the test. It's about measuring what you're doing. It's about being able to say, look, we can deploy a thousand times a day. We don't need to, but we can. And we know we have deployed, and we have these, these, and these failures, and we know how many users we have. But it's also about sharing the ID. It's about telling people, look, we build our infrastructure this way. We do release management this way because we've experienced it's a good ID. And that's what DevOps is about. So, I hope that after this session you guys think a bit about, well, what if my machine crash? Do we have backups? Where are the bugs in our platform? And that on Sunday, you can actually throw away one virtual machine and get up and running on Monday again with another instance.
Okay, any questions? 15 minutes exactly. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no questions. Either a good sign or a very bad sign. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, it depends on which country you are. Okay, two questions. Yeah. Um, so, what is your opinion of platforms like Heroku and stuff like that? Basically, try to do all the administration stuff and hence, I guess, is not really that compatible with that one? Um, it is compatible because it tries to get a lot of work away from the developer. The only thing is that there's still developer, there's still infrastructure people behind it. Uh, I think. One of the guys we had at the first DevOps conference, uh, is the also I think he's working for Heroku, trying to do this, and they internally work like this. But they offer a platform as a service, so you can easily start doing stuff on top of it. And Heroku is running on Amazon. Which is, Heroku is being bought by Salesforce, so it's a really interesting from a commercial point of view what's going to happen there. Because Salesforce is also a cloud service provider. But they. They can actually grow to the size because they think and build infrastructure this way. And I was thinking you said it's important to get your ops and your devs around the table, but if you outsource your ops... You still need to talk to them, you still need to work together with them and know what the dependencies are. Yes. My question is a little bit weird. For, to me, you're not a doctor. <coughs> What I mean is that when I have a problem, I go to the doctor, has problem, and he gives me a solution, and I can see exactly the consequences of it. It's, is it the right solution or not? <coughs> and can I'm you? In general, yes. Mm -hmm. In general, yes. And what's your doctor saying? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what I want to know is, because I, I absolutely no, I have no uh, technical skills about anything you've talked about, it's the first time I see all these terms, how can I see uh, working with a developer or something else how can I measure, measure that the solutions he's providing are good or not? That's a really good question. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I think experience is it. If you see that two weeks into production you actually crash, then he's been doing a bad job. If you see that everything stays up and if you don't see any problems going on, then you see it's okay. And that's one of the problems that system administrators had for the past decade. We only were the bad guys when things went wrong and nobody ever told us great job when everything was up and running for five years. So, unlike your doctor, you only meet your doctor when, he, when you're ill. And it used to be the same, but what do you do with people who do health prevention? It's more like, we're gonna explain you how you are gonna keep healthy, how you're gonna keep in shape, rather than having to go and cure all the problems afterwards. Yes. How can you recognize a good developer not being a developer? He has a beauty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that's just a lazy one. <laughs> How can you recognize a good developer not being a developer? Ask another guy. So, if you. let me explain. If you have a business idea, mm -hmm. you're not a developer, but you have a business idea, and you're like trying to uh, build a team, and in that team you want to attract some developers, what are the characteristics you need to look for? You try to find a guy you trust, who is a developer, who maybe not have time for your project, and you ask him to interview him. Because yes. it's really difficult for a non-technical person um, to get the good stuff out there. It could be somebody who's really good at talking about explaining stuff, but knowing shit about code, and he'll convince you. But put him next to a real developer, and he's gonna fall through any second. So ask somebody who knows. Get some help. Try. Try, yeah. Give him the homework, let him do stuff, but still, you cannot read the quality of his code. So, King Sherman is about getting stuff done, and if it, it doesn't crash, then it should be okay. It's not just crashing, it's running smooth, staying stable. But it's not easy. Here's a last question. Okay, mine's last. Here's a more techy question for you. So in the in the second or third slide, you had uh, you stated that the, most of the small websites on the internet 
uh, people who build that, they don't use these enterprise-y softwares, like they don't know what is UML and things like that. Um, no, I didn't state that. Uh, then I, I stated uh, that small companies are much quicker in getting from ID to production than large enterprises. And they could be perfectly using UML to write user stories and all this stuff. They're just not blocked by 15 layers of management before they all are allowed to put something in production. They are not blocked by some old school IBM tooling and some procurement department that demands them, well, if you need a machine, it's going to take you four to six weeks before you get a quote and then another six weeks before you actually get the machine physically and then another three weeks before we got an operating system installed and then two more weeks to get the application stacked on top of it. No, they just go to Amazon and deploy. That's the difference. They use similar technology, they use similar tools, just a lot more agile, just more flexible. And that's what companies are asking now too. They don't want to have the, the procurement chain of six months anymore. Okay, because then I, I, I initially understood you that, uh, that the problem is that the enterprise, these big enterprises uses, use these tools that Mm, no, it's not about the tools you use, it's about how you use them. You can use any tool wrong. But if you look at how culture is in, in a company and how you get to do stuff, that's the change we have to do. It's the mindset of a small company, the mindset of something that's flexible, as opposed to a big, big, huge, giant boat, which is really difficult to turn around. That's a difference. All right. Okay.